Braden Winterton. I work for Brigham Young University. Um, if you want to tweet me, I am responsive on Twitter. So if you have questions, stuff like that, I will try to get back to you. Um, so yeah, I was brought on to BYU to implement our new API management um, system. We're going to kind of walk through the story of how that all happened, what things we did, why we hated our old system. You'll get all the dirty details. So um, first of all, a little bit about BYU. So we like to call ourselves a city. Um, we've got dozens of development teams that run independently from each other. We run hundreds of separate code bases, and we currently have published in production over 450 APIs. Um, it's a lot of disparate stuff to keep track of, to maintain, to figure out what's going on at any given point in time. It's like running a small city. Um, we also have a lot of varying customers. So at BYU, we have a centralized IT department um, called OIT, the Office of Information Technology. And a lot of our applications are developed internally. They're for internal uses. But we also have a lot of customers on campus. Um, we also have some IT departments on campus for individual colleges, for individual classes and courses that all want to consume the data that we're producing. And so these APIs aren't just produced for internal consumption, but external on campus and external to the world in some cases as well. Um, our CIO came out, it's been about two years now, um, with a manifesto. And told everyone that we were going to go with an API-first architecture. Um, that meant that from that day forward, no application was allowed to get data from another application's database. If it needed it, it needed to go through an API, it needed to do it in a governed process, and needed to do it in the correct way. Um, that kind of sparked our need to have a good API management solution and to be able to handle that well. Um, and the last point is, I think like any higher ed university, and really like any company, we have a ton of legacy code that we're dealing with on top of the new greenfield and brownfield development that we're handling on a daily basis. We have millions of lines of code that are over 20 years old that are critical to day-to-day -day production usage. Um, so that was quite a feat as well in our API management solution. So let's go back in time a couple of years when this all started. Um, we wanted a couple of things out of our API management solution. We wanted a centralized repository for all of the APIs that we produce. We wanted one place where the developers could go to search for whatever API they were looking for. Be able to find it and know that if it existed, that was where they were going to find it. Um, and not only be able to find it there, but be able to understand what authorization was involved, the authentication, all of that needed to be in a centralized place. We wanted it to obviously be low latency. We have some really, really slow APIs with that 20-year-old code, and we can't make them any slower than they already are. Um, we also wanted to have a low impact on the developer work that was currently going on. We didn't want everyone to halt, have to go backwards, change everything that they had done, and really just interrupt all the work that was currently going on. We wanted to make as little of a hiccup as we possibly could as we did this transition. Um, we wanted monitoring, obviously. We wanted to know who was calling what APIs, when, how often. We wanted to get all of that analytical data out of our API manager. Um, and we wanted a centralized place for documentation as well as that API search. So this was the problem we were faced with. We had an existing API manager that was running on old, unsupported third-party code. Um, closed source, we had no rights to do anything to it. It was out of support for a couple of years by the time we got to this point. Um, not only that, but we had two versions in production. We had started with one version spun up a new version, started a migration process that never finished. So we ran two separate versions of that infrastructure. And it was a mess to find out which version it was in. Um, we also had a lovely homebrewed non-standard authentication mechanism um, using API keys and nonces. And it was bound together with twine and duct tape however we decided it was going to. And the best part was it wasn't documented anywhere. and so. If you had to interact with our APIs, good luck. Hopefully you could find someone who had domain knowledge about that, or you were reverse engineering code to figure out how that worked. Um, we also had the fun case of we got to reboot the boxes nightly in a cron job because there was a memory leak. So if we didn't reboot them every night, next day about noon, all API traffic ceased. So we got to reboot those things every night. And then there was no monitoring. We had no idea who was calling what, how often. The best we could do is pull IP addresses, which is extremely unhelpful. Um, we could tie down to an IP address, hopefully track down where that was on campus, but 99% of the time that was zero help at all. 
Um, and the documentation support was grossly out of date. The process when we had started this was that you were required to put in documentation and support contacts when you publish the API. And many times that was the last time it was updated. We had support contacts that hadn't worked at BYU for over five years. Um, so we were in a really serious situation. So we decided we've got to fix this. This is a horrible solution. This is not going to work for the new direction that the CIO wants us to go. If we want to increase this API consumption, make it easier, this is not the way to do it. So we came up with a few criteria as to what we needed in a new API solution. We needed to utilize industry standards. No more homebrewed authentication. We were done with that, and so were our developers. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were utilizing things that would allow the developers to take a hold of all of the resources out there in the internet and out there that all these other people have done. Utilize something standard. Um, we also wanted to be able to integrate with our legacy systems. We didn't have time to change 20-year-old code to make sure it worked with the new API manager. We needed something that would snap in and work. We just don't have the time and effort to be able to do that. Um, we also wanted, again, this low impact on work. We didn't want to drastically change the way the ship was going. We didn't want to make things totally halt while we did new things. We wanted to make sure everything could continue to function as it was intended. Um, we also wanted to keep up documentation up to date, which I think is everyone's pipe dream. Um, we wanted to keep that up to date. No system can do that on its own, but we wanted to ease that up for the developers as much as possible, because we knew we need their help. Um, we also wanted to improve API discoverability. With 450 APIs and customers across campus that haven't the slightest as to how OIT's systems work, it was really hard for them to find the API they were looking for. They may know that they're looking for financial aid information, but they had in the slightest as to which API or APIs produced that information, what they looked like, which ones produced the right pieces. That was really hard. Um, and we wanted monitoring out of it, and we wanted it to be performant. So we came up with a solution. After several years of investigatory work and trying out different products, um, trying out a lot of different platforms, different approaches to our problems. And this is a solution we came up with. It's a pieces of a lot of different things. Um, and you'll notice that WSO2 is definitely the heart of all of that. Um, our use of WSO2 API Manager and Identity Server has made our lives a dream come true. We're able to accomplish almost everything that we ever wanted our API Management solution to do, um, along with all these other supporting pieces. And we'll kind of walk through why those supporting pieces are there. So let's start with the API Manager Identity Server. You may be asking why did we pick API Manager and Identity Server from WSO2. We're at WSO2Con, so I can tell you we did pick them. It was you know, a good choice. But there were a lot of reasons that WSO2 stuck out amongst all of the other products that we tried. One of them was the subscription and monitoring was beautiful. Requiring subscriptions to be able to let consumers get through to the API was our fantasy. It was our wildest dreams come true. We could finally force the developers to tell us who they were before they started consuming that API. We had a list of names when an API needed to be updated, was down. We knew who to contact, and we knew who those people were consuming and who were expecting it to run in production. And we also wanted to know which of those people were our high-end consumers, who did we need to watch out for, what was going on across the campus. You know, how much stuff was getting used. Do we have APIs that just aren't used at all anymore, are only used by one person? Um, all of that information was information that we didn't have access to and was something that was de definitely necessary and we found in WSO2. Message mediation was absolutely critical to what we've done with WSO2. With message mediation, we've been able to integrate with all of our legacy systems. Plug and play, we went overnight. Um, with message mediation, we're able to translate the OAuth authentication coming in onto the front end and the JWAT that's produced on the back end. I say JWAT, I know it's JOT, I don't like that. So if I say JWAT, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the JWAT that comes through, we're able to translate that into the old authentication headers and the old authentication mechanisms. So the old legacy systems continue to work as they were intended. They continue to think that the authentication works the way it always has. But our consumers are now able to use a unified interface all through OAuth through the WSO2 store. It's also very high performance. In all of our tests and all of the work that we've done with WSO2, we found minimal latency at best that was added onto our flows and added onto our API calls. Even when we were mediating quite heavily, um, the, the latency that we were adding was negligible. And that was 
something that was critical for us. We were very afraid. We knew message mediation was a thing. We knew we would want to use it, but we were afraid that was going to spike our latency quite a bit, and it hasn't, and we've loved that. And a huge point for us at BYU is it's open source. Like was mentioned at BNY Mellon, open source is a love of ours. We love open source. We love to contribute out to the open source community. And it puts us in a much better position than we were in with a closed source, non-supported software. Um, we have the ability to change things if we need to. We have the ability to deeply integrate with our systems. Um, and we have been able to deeply integrate with our systems. Things like we've hooked the subscription process. Today, really in the future, in a soon future, you'll be able to block subscriptions on our API store. So producers of the APIs are able to flag their APIs as restricted or in development. And in both of those cases, if a subscription is requested, it's put on hold and is sent off in an email to the support group asking for approval to be able to subscribe to that API. Our model is open subscription first, but we definitely have some use cases where we needed to be able to block that subscription until further approval was granted. And we've been able to do that with the open source in WSO2. We've also been able to hook into all of our systems. We've been able to decorate the JWAT. So the JWAT coming out of WSO2 is decorated with all of our BYU identifiers. So the consumers on the back end are getting all of the information they need to know about the consumer in the standard format that they're expecting to receive it from BYU. Things like employee IDs and usernames, all of that kind of information is returned to them in our general format. And we've been able to do that because we've been able to hook the code in WSO2. And another huge thing was it followed standards, which was a breath of fresh air. Um, standards like OAuth 2 and Swagger, all of those things have become critical in our infrastructure today. And so focus on those for just a minute. What did standards give us? It gave us a lot of headache lost. Um, we didn't have developers trying to figure out how authentication was supposed to work or what kind of things they were going to be getting on the back end how all of that was supposed to play out. Oh, well, this code used to work. It doesn't anymore because someone changed things. We had a lot of headache with all of that home-brewed custom built. By switching to standards, our developers are able to use the plethora of libraries available out there to be able to utilize to read the JWATs, to be able to handle OAuth 2. It saves our developers a ton of time as they're trying to set up both their APIs and their applications to consume those APIs. It helps on both ends of that. And these four standards specifically have been crucial to that migration for us. OAuth 2 for authentication on the front end and OpenID Connect for those applications on the front end to be able to identify who is sitting at their application, who's sitting at the keyboard. Um, Swagger for all of our documentation and the JWT that gets passed to the back end so that the API is able to identify who's asking for certain information and if they're authorized to see such information. <sighs> So just with moving to WSO2 and integrating those standards that had been brought to us with the WSO2 infrastructure, we had written off a lot of our requirements already. Um, we were able to utilize those industry standards. We were able to integrate with our legacy systems in a beautiful fashion that we had proved would work. Um, we were able to do that. And because we were able to integrate to those legacy systems and not cause disruption to existing work being done, we really were almost zero impact to the work being done when we migrated. We also finally got monitoring analytics out of WSO2, which is phenomenal and something that we have never experienced and we're quite enjoying. It's still like a new toy. Um, and it was very performant um, and continues to be to this day. So we wanted to solve these two problems still. And we still had these fishing out there of keeping the documentation up to date and improving the API discoverability. Um, WSO2 has a search built into the store, but without knowing the name or certain aspects about it, it was hard for consumers to find what they were actually looking for. It really required domain knowledge of what the API was called, how it was organized, where it had been published. It uh, required a lot of domain knowledge to be able to find that, and that was something that a lot of our API consumers do not have. Even inside of our internal organization, it's hard for one team to know what the other team is doing because things happen so quickly. So we wanted to start with a single question, which was, how can we improve discovery? Um, how could we improve the experience that our consumers were having in trying to find the APIs that they were looking for? Um, this question actually ended up leading us to an answer that solved both of those problems on the last slide, of both improving discoverability and keeping documentation up to date. 
Um, and that in huge part was done with the next piece of our implementation, which is the BYU developer portal. Um, after a lot of investigation, we did a lot of work trying to figure out a good way to handle this, we've ended up creating a tool that we call the developer portal that helps onboard users onto our API ecosystem, as well as helping them to go through the process. We pieced together quite a few tools that you'll see in a minute. Um, and so we wanted to make that process as easy as possible for them, to be able to jump from place to place to place and know where they are in our process. So really, a lot of the developer portal is fed by Swagger. Um, for those of you who don't use Swagger or don't know what Swagger is, try it out. It's awesome. Swagger is now also known as the Open API standard. It is a documentation standard for APIs. Um, it allows you to document paths, response models, object schemas, response codes, all of that in a very standardized way. And Swagger's team has produced a lot of tools that are able to read those definitions, create pseudocode, create real API consumption code automatically, um, and really do a lot of things with that documentation in an automated fashion, which is huge. Um, so our current setup, we now have a set up where all of our organizations get repositories if they contain a Swagger file. Um, there's a couple other little things in there that are organization specific, but when that Swagger file is found in the organization's repo, it's automatically ripped out of the repo on every update, formatted, turned into HTML code for a prettier look at the documentation, and shoved into the developer portal automatically. Um, obviously, the code doesn't keep itself up to date. We have to rely on the developers to keep that documentation up to date. But we've tried to make it as easy as we possibly could for them. All we ask them to do is keep the documentation in their Git repository and their Swagger file up to date. As long as they do that, we handle the rest. We publish that out to all of the consumers. We publish that in public places. We make sure it's always kept up to date, documented in all of the right places. And they don't ever have to worry about manual uploads or going and editing stuff or remembering that they've changed something. And it's made their lives a lot easier to be able to handle that. This is what our developer portal looks like on the front page. My product manager would kill me if I didn't tell you. It was in beta, so it's in beta. But we, the purpose of the developer portal, again, is to help onboard all of these consumers. Um, we've got a lot of consumers internal to the organization. They've got some of that domain knowledge. They don't really need the whole onboarding process. But we have quite a few consumers and an increasing number of consumers as the days go on that are outside of our internal organization that don't have any of that knowledge that really need to be kind of walked through the process. Um, we try to drive them to this getting started, to consume an API. We allow them to search for any API um, either by name and we also search by all of the data elements involved in the API. So with the swagger filled out and with those response models filled out, we're able to allow the consumers to search for an API that produces financial aid information, or produces first name, or produces social security number. They're able to find which APIs produce which data elements specifically they are looking for. Um, in BYU's case, we typically have, the joke is we typically have 50 APIs that will produce what you actually want. Um, and we're trying to help those developers find the APIs they're looking for and narrow down which one is the right one for them. And the developer portal helps them get there. Um, this is a brief view of some API documentation that's been automatically ripped out of the repository, formatted appropriately, and spit into the repository, or spit into the portal. Um, on the left-hand side, we've also integrated quite a few other tools that we use in our API ecosystem for the developers to be able to see and utilize. For example, community. We have essentially Stack Overflow um, that allows the developers to ask questions about API. They're having problems they don't understand or something's going wrong. Asking those questions in the community allows them to be answered and documented, um, which is a huge problem we've had in the past of person-to-person -person answers don't get propagated. We answer the same question 50 times in a week. Um, but the community helps us to be able to document all of those answers and what is the best solution in those cases. We've also hooked in something that we call InfoHub, which is how we manage authorization in our APIs for high-level administrative access. So when a consumer needs access to, say, all students' social security numbers, they're going to get reamed over a coal, but they can go through that process automatically and we'll help them get there. And finally, we can, we also let them jump right out into the API store where they're allowed to 
jump in, subscribe to that API, start with the try it feature, and get working through all of that. And so we're trying to make sure that those developers can get to where they need to go as fast as they possibly can. So how has it worked thus far? Honestly, thus far, we've had great results. We're currently actually in about 30% migration. Um, we've got about 30% of the traffic from the old system migrated. We've currently got a end date of April 30th is the day that I will happily pull the plug on the old system. Um, and unfortunately, when I took my screenshots, you didn't get to see that. If you go to the developer portal now, which I'll point you to at the end, we have a lovely ticking countdown because we want everyone to be very afraid. So um, it's worked great. Our developers that have migrated are having a fantastic experience. They're able to use things in a standard way. They're able to find the documentation they're looking for. They're able to utilize libraries. Things aren't drastically different. All of their old systems are continuing to work, and they're getting a lot better reliability out of what they're trying. Um, all of these efforts have actually been really received with hardly any pushback at all, other than just the time that we're taking to migrate all of this consumption from one to another. Um, we've actually had quite a bit of increased API consumption as well. We originally were intending to only, for the next couple months, deal with migration. But we probably added an extra 500,000 calls a day that's all new, um, that wasn't existing in the old traffic and in the old API management system. So we've had a great time with it. Now, if you want to see any of our code, we open source everything that we do with WSO2. Um, GitHub.com, BYUIT, app dev. Now, let me warn you, we have a ton of repositories. So I should have tacked on the end of here. If you go specifically to the repository WSO2-meta, We'll link you out to all of our WSO2 repositories that are currently public. We've got a couple we're trying to clean up to make sure they go public. Um, but we try to open source all of that work and share it, especially with those who are in the same situations as we are. Um, and you can also visit our developer portal at developer.byu.edu and play around with it if you feel the need. And so, and kind of see what we've, what we've come up with and what we've accomplished so far. We're still kind of in the beginning of this journey. We're not all the way there yet. We've got some other changes we'd like to make. We've got some things we'd like to do to improve. But thus far, WSO2 has been fundamental in everything that we've done and really has made quite a difference in our API architecture already. And we're excited for the future. Thank you.